I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to our presentation on corporate social responsibility. Uh, my name is Bob Kirk with the Canadian Apparel Federation. We're the host for this event, and uh, we'll be joined in a couple of minutes by uh, Avida Safarian from RAP, his colleagues at RAP, and also Georgetta from StormTech. Uh, the reason we organized this uh, session today is, uh, well, it's, uh, maybe obvious that um, CSR has become a, a bigger issue these days. Uh, we have uh, issues around forced labor in various countries around the world. We have uh, a great deal of um, disruption uh, among uh, different places in the supply chain. And so things like monitoring labor conditions in factories in three countries all over the world is a very timely subject. So it's not just that uh, we want to remind people that they should have obligations or um, incentives to monitor the uh, factory conditions that uh, operate. Uh, but I think it's important to highlight companies or organizations such as RAP that are solutions providers. So we're, we're not talking about uh, problems in any specific country, but we're talking about solutions to address your supply chain wherever it is. So the reason we're holding the session today is, is to introduce a solutions provider and to make sure that you understand what they can do for a company such as yours. So the session today will run about one hour. Uh, I think the remarks will be something around 45 to 50 minutes. And at any point during that time, uh, anyone that's on the call today can submit a question through the um, control panel, and that's usually in the top right-hand side of your page. There should be a question icon. Click the icon, ask the question. Uh, you can do it at any time. Uh, if you're doing it in the middle of the session, maybe give a little bit of uh, context. Uh, Avidis said this. What does that mean? Uh, so again, if we are picking it up 20 minutes after you ask it, it'll have some context. So that's the first thing, ask questions. You can ask them as they occur to you. You can ask them at the end, and you can also ask them afterwards. Uh, at the end of the day, they'll all go to the presenters if we can't handle them during the session. So the bottom line is ask questions. Other thing today is that the session is recorded, so you don't need to take a bunch of notes. If you have a specific uh, slide that you're interested in, there's a screenshot function at the top of your page. Click the screenshot, it'll uh, take a, uh, a ping file of that page. So it's very easy to take some of the things that are important, um, wait for the recording and for the other things, and I believe, unless there's a problem, uh, that uh, RAP will be able to distribute the full PDF if that's uh, needed. So the bottom line is don't write like crazy, it'll be recorded, uh, the PDF should be available, ask questions, and that's really it. So again, we'll run for about one hour. At this point, I'm gonna ask Avidus to see if he can join us. Um, and let's just see, yeah, very good. Video looks good. Hopefully audio sounds good too. Very good. So what I'll do is I'll do a quick introduction of Avidus. Uh, known him for a number of years. He joined RAP in 2004 and became the CEO in 2012 and anyone that knows him knows he has a, a really detailed knowledge of uh, social accountability social responsibility issues in this sector uh, he's on uh, uh, various uh, panels and various uh, recognitions um, among them he was recognized by ascent compliance which is actually based in ottawa as one of the top 100 csr influencers uh, for 2020 uh, he speaks on a lot of topics. Many people on the line may have seen him at various conferences. And he, among other things, was on the uh, uh, Board of Advisors for the Alliance for Bangladesh Worker Safety. He's got lots of other credentials. I'll let him speak to any that uh, uh, merit attention. But uh, I think he brings a lot to the file. It's a huge commitment to RAP. And uh, I I'm sure that you'll enjoy his presentation. So Avidus will start, Mark Yeager also from RAP will join at a later point, and Georgetta from StormTech will come on. We're working up to Georgetta. So at the peak of the presentation, we'll be speaking to Georgetta from StormTech. 
Uh, so what, with that, I will hand the floor over to Abedis. All right. Thank you very much, Bob. I appreciate it. It's always a pleasure to engage with you and with the Canadian Apparel Federation uh, writ large. Uh, we're talking today about corporate social responsibility. We're going to look at the current state of play and then look down the road. Uh, as Bob mentioned, this is meant to be about solutions, uh, but of course, to get to the solutions, uh, we are going to start with a better sense of what the problem or problems are that we're trying to address, and uh, we have a little panel here to do that. As uh, Bob said, I'm the president and CEO of RAP, Avery Stefanian. I'll be joined in a bit by my colleague, Mark Jager, who's the vice president of stakeholder engagement at RAP, and then we'll be hearing from Georgetta Navadorsky from uh, StormTech, the vice president of supply chain there. What we're going to be covering uh, for the, about half an hour, 35 minutes or so, and hopefully saving the bulk of the time for Q&A, which is really where the solutions can be tailored to whatever is on your minds, that's kind of the plan here, is, uh, as I mentioned, a good sense of the landscape, the problem set that we're dealing with, starting with some stuff that I know I will be saying, which is not new to you, I'm just putting it in context as I describe the current state of supply chains, the current state of the overall marketplace, especially for branded apparel, um, and then uh, building up to the current state of social compliance and CSR uh, writ large. Um, I'll hand over the presentation at that point to my colleague, Mark, who will walk you through an overview of RAP, uh, get, uh, get into some of the nuts and bolts of, of what uh, we do, and then we'll hear from StormTech, who will provide a user's perspective. As Bob said, we're gonna build up to the special guest appearance there. Uh, I'll be back after that to do the second part of the title, the look down the road, uh, highlight some of the hot topics that are currently um, plaguing uh, us practitioners in this space, and then uh, hopefully provide at least the broad outlines of what best practices could look like and, and should uh, look like uh, for those who are in this space. Um, the plan, as I mentioned, is to make sure we save plenty of time at the end for uh, some real discussion and, and Q&A. So I will echo Bob in encouraging you to type in your questions as they occur to you. Uh, we'll do everything we can to answer them all on the air. But as mentioned, if we don't get to any, we'll make sure we get back to you after the panel uh, is complete. Um, and yes, the PDF can easily be made available as part of the, uh, the process here. All right, let's get going. The part that you all are very familiar with, uh, I'll, I'll give it a really short shrift, is how supply chains have really changed from back in the day when if you were a Canadian brand, uh, or for that matter, any Western brand anywhere, you would be making your product in a factory that more than likely you owned and operated and was therefore in your geography. Uh, in the 80s into the 90s, things started to change and the outsourcing model became the more prevalent economic model for manufacturing. So today, instead of having a more or less limited one, two, three handful of factories that you own and operate, now your supply chain is made up of dozens of factories spread out all over the world. And in the apparel space, as we know, the vast majority of the manufacturing is still happening out in Asia. So that's why I chose that particular group of flags to uh, highlight. Now, what this means then is today's supply chains are fragmented, are very complex, and as mentioned, are worldwide. And that has several implications, uh, chief among them being the difficulty in visibility when it comes to the ultimate buyer, the, the brand or the retailer. Uh, whereas, you know, when manufacturing took place in an owned and operated facility, you would know what was going on because you are literally there every day. This is no longer the case for the vast majority of Western brands and retailers. They don't have that kind of direct visibility into factory conditions. What another implication uh, and one that is particularly significant with regards to the rise of social compliance as an important issue with, uh, when it comes to sourcing these days is that these complicated, fragmented, and worldwide supply chains are made further complicated by the fact that we now operate in a world where modern technology gives us the ability of global instant communication. Anything happening anywhere in the world is gonna be on CNN or BBC, and perhaps more importantly, on social media, on Facebook and Twitter, within hours, or if it's bad news, within minutes of happening. And there is just no way to understate how quickly and how, how far news can travel in today's world. 
So what this means for folks who are in the supply chain, operating uh, supply chains and sourcing operations, is that you're now doing so in an environment where reputation risk is higher than it's ever been, where managing that, where managing supply chains is a global issue with very high stakes, because as mentioned, all it will take is for that one damning photo of your logo in the rubble of a factory that's collapsed or among the ruins of a facility that's burnt down to go viral. And the implications of that are just extremely negative for your organization. The other element that this brings to, high, to, for, to the fore is that you now need to constantly and proactively manage your reputational risk in the supply chain. You can no longer simply set it and forget it when it comes to systems management protocols. You have to be on 24 seven because when you're Factories are asleep, your consumers are awake, and when your consumers are asleep, your factories are up and running. So there's this constant uh, ongoing uh, activity that you have to stay abreast of and, and be aware of. Now, that's the evolution of supply chains. Uh, at the same time that was happening, we've seen a real change and evolution when it comes to the modern marketplace. Not that long ago, the predominant method of distribution was still good old fashioned brick and mortar outlets. We know that's not true anymore. And we know that the pandemic really accelerated an already burgeoning trend towards an increased online presence when it comes to sales through websites and other uh, social media based applications. So that today, the modern marketplace is really all about omni-channel. Right? Those brands, retailers that did better during the pandemic Nobody did great for the most part. We were all coming out of this pretty scarred, uh, but those that were relatively unscathed were the ones that were able to really pivot or really build on their online presence, their website, their ability to get product to customers quickly, whether through their own site, through third party sites, through direct sales on social media platforms. So this, this modern marketplace really ups the ante uh, for social compliance because one, obvious consequence of this is that the battlefield for branding has shifted. Not that long ago, the whole branding process was something quite strongly controlled by the brand or retailer in question. They made the ads, they created the content, they determined which outlets that content would go out through, point of purchase uh, displays, you know, TV shows, Super Bowl ads, what have you but it was all controlled by the brand or the retailer. Now, today, this is where the battlefield for branding has shifted to. All the branding is happening on social media through likes, through comments, through tweets, through TikTok videos. And the big consequence of all that is that the control of the content has been taken away from the brands and retailers and really been vested with the ultimate consumers themselves because they're the ones doing the reviewing, they're the ones providing the comments, they're the ones doing the tweeting and creating those infamous TikTok videos. So all of this really has a very significant effect on your ability to control the narrative, to truly brand your product. The final societal level evolutionary change that is worth discussing is that of the very core essence of what a corporation is. Now, the pandemic may have slowed down some of this conversation, but just before the pandemic, a lot of discussion had come up on the purpose of a corporation. What is its raison d'etre? And uh, in the summer of 2019, The Economist had this covered. What are companies for? Asking the question whether the sort of age old adage about the business of business being business continues to be true. They said no, and they hinted that there has to be a societal purpose behind a corporation, even if it is just a for-profit shareholder-owned entity. The month immediately after that Economist cover, Fortune magazine put out this cover and took the question one step further, specifically saying that big business has to have it both ways, profit and purpose. And they had a range of CEOs out there from companies going from IBM to Johnson & Johnson and JP Morgan Chase in, in between to echo that point about how you need to have a corporate purpose in addition to simply being after profits. So this is the brave new world that we are now managing supply chains in. And so 
The answer to the question, you know, why does social compliance, why does CSR matter in this context, um, was actually given more than a decade ago, in my opinion, by this gentleman, who some of you may recognize, and for those of you who don't, I will name him in a second, when he said in a memo to uh, uh, his shareholders, it takes 20 years to build a reputation and five minutes to ruin it. If you think about that, you'll do things differently. Those of you who recognize the picture know I'm talking about Warren Buffett, the CEO of Berkshire Hathaway, that famed sage of Omaha, and someone who knows a thing or two about making money. Uh, so when he speaks about these things, I tend to listen and I tend to agree. Although in this particular case, I would submit that Warren got one piece of it slightly wrong. Yes, it takes a long time, 20 years more, to build a truly solid brand, a truly, truly solid reputation. But nowadays, you can ruin it in a lot faster than five minutes. As I said, the world is beset with the ubiquity of social media and the ever presence of these smartphones so that everybody is potentially a reporter and all it will take is that one damning photo or that one short video that links your brand to forced labor somewhere or child labor somewhere or a dangerous factory somewhere and there goes years and years worth of reputation building right down the drain. And the scary part is how quickly and how far that information can spread these days. So what this means then is social compliance in this brave new world that we are occupying uh, is really founded on, it requires the brand and re retailer to conduct effective due diligence on their supply chains. You no longer have the luxury of owning and operating these facilities, but you still have to make sure that you understand who it is that you're doing business with because otherwise the risks to your entire operation, your entire existence as a company uh, can be tremendous. Um, this kind of social compliance due diligence has to focus on a wide range of safety and labor issues. That's at the core of it. Uh, the labor issues and the safety issues derive from the ILO, the International Labor Organization conventions on, on minimal uh, requirements when it comes to workplace conditions as the base. Any corporate code of conduct any program independent uh, leave, uh, doing supply chain due diligence like RAP draws from the core ILO conventions as the base. And the due diligence takes the form of verification done through workplace audits. And what these audits check is whether or not you have a facility engaging in forced or compulsory labor, an absolute core component, very foundational principle that anybody working anywhere has to be doing so of their own free will. Now, another obviously core component to this is no child labor. In many ways, this was the issue that got the social compliance industry going in the uh, late 90s and early 2000s. Several other core issues include things like making sure freedom of association is properly respected in the factories that you are sourcing from, and that there is acceptable working conditions with regards to things like wages, proper payment uh, with regards to the hours being worked, and a broad range of issues with regards to the health and safety of the workers themselves. Also, uh, no discrimination ought to be happening in the supply chains. These are the kind of things that these um, uh, due diligence efforts have to focus on and have to do so credibly, which becomes more and more lately a question of independently, as we'll discuss uh, in a little bit uh, further. I will also mention here that uh, these kinds of due diligence exercises are paying increasing attention to the environment uh, as part of that broader conversation about sustainability. Uh, so also a, an important element for folks tasked with supply chain uh, due diligence responsibility. Okay, uh, that I think does it with regards to laying down the groundwork of the sort of overall space in which we're operating in. I will hand things over now to my colleague, Mark, um, for him to tell you a little bit more about RAP as an organization. Thank you, Avadis, and good afternoon and good morning. My name's Mark Jagger. I'm RAP's Vice President of Stakeholder Engagement. I'm gonna drill down a little bit and talk a little bit about what RAP is and how it works and how it can be a solution for each of you. So um, what I wanna just establish here is a little bit of, of the basics. RAP is a 21-year-old program. It is now the largest third-party certification program for some products. Our focus remains on working conditions and facilities around the world. We're a nonprofit organization 
We're not driven by revenue growth goals or shareholder return. Instead, our focus is to extend the number of workers that are operating or working in a RAP certified facility. Today, that number sits at about 2.8 million workers around the world. Over the next five years, we have a goal of bringing that number up to 5 million. And we're going to do that by offering a, a great solution to the challenge of uh, social compliance uh, certifica uh, certification. Uh, RAP uh, is a, a program of choice for industry associations. We've had a long relationship with the AAFA. We have a growing uh, relationship with Canadian Apparel Federation. We have a good relationship with the International Apparel Federation and uh, textile and apparel associations uh, around the world. So with that quick overview, why don't we go to the next chart, Avadis? So how is RAP structured? RAP is a program with 12 principles. These principles are derived from the areas that Avadis was just referring to, the International Labor Organization, conventions, uh, if not in the letter, at least in the spirit, in terms of the core values in the first seven or eight of our principles. United Nations guiding principles on business and human rights, and the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises. But the first principle is a critical one, and that is compliance with laws where the facility operates. We're a rule of law program. Uh, in addition, we have an overlay of uh, minimal uh, basic uh, standards for uh, human rights that are recognized by some of these programs I just mentioned. So some of the programs that we compete with, if you will, in this space uh, also uh, follow these basic uh, principles established in some of these uh, leading organizations. Uh, what can help set and does set RAP apart is some of the additional principles that we focus on. Avadis mentioned principle 10, the environment. We're not uh, a detailed environmental compliance scheme, but we do pay attention to that issue and we have for the last 20 years. And it's become an increasingly important goal for companies to not only meet their local requirements uh, for environmental regulation, but to also demonstrate that they're reusing, reducing, and recycling to protect the environment and meet sustainability goals. The RAP program will help identify progress in these areas. But very interestingly, RAP's long had uh, two principles, 11 and 12, that deal with the actual uh, uh, shipment of goods from a uh, facility into your country. And what are the customs regulations and how are you doing in complying with those? And Principle 12 in particular deals with security. And RAP has uh, intentionally been tracking the uh, US Customs and Border Patrol CTPAT minimum security requirements under its Principle 12. And we recently updated our documentation to track the uh, new minimum security requirements for the CTPAT program. And this will um, come forward in a moment when I talk a little bit about the value equation for RAP. But you might say, well, you know, Mark, you're talking to a Canadian audience today. Why are you focused on uh, U.S. Customs uh, regulation? Well, of course, there's a mutual recognition agreement between uh, the CBSA and USCBP from 2008, which seeks to harmonize the two programs and to have them work in concert. So to the extent that you have a requirement under your partner and protection program to demonstrate security uh, sensibilities uh, in your supply chain, um, the RAP program will help you document that. So if we could go to the next slide, Avadis. So where, where's RAP located? How are we doing this business uh, of social compliance uh, globally? RAP is headquartered in the Washington, D.C. area, um, but we have representatives or offices in uh, Latin America, Europe, Bangladesh, Hong Kong, India, and in Southeast Asia, including Thailand, uh, Vietnam, and Indonesia. These locations have been intentionally chosen and staffed based on sourcing patterns as they have shifted uh, for the global apparel uh, industry. And these track, I think, closely as well with your key sourcing regions of China, 
Bangladesh, Vietnam, and Cambodia. On the ground in these locations, we have social compliance experts. They're multilingual. They're providing education, training, introduction to the program. They're speaking to the facility managers and groups. They're also interacting with our monitoring partners who wrap identifies trains and accredits in each country to ensure that the auditors are meeting RAP standards. I'll just take a moment and mention uh, why we have a person in Europe. Um, certainly, we don't do a lot of uh, apparel production in, in Western Europe. But on the other hand, it's a key destination for goods. And I'm sure some of you are already selling your goods into Europe or have plans to do that at some point in the future. What's interesting about Europe is unlike the US and Canada, where social compliance is largely a, a voluntary exercise uh, by responsible brands and, and, and importers, in Europe, there's a trend that's fairly pronounced in moving forward towards mandatory human rights due diligence at the state and or regional EU level. And we can expect soon that if you're going to tr sell your goods in Europe, you need to be able to demonstrate you've done due diligence at the facility level that your facilities are respecting basic human rights. Uh, RAP is a program that's already been recognized by at least one country uh, for its ability to certify for social compliance and human rights. <laughs> Go to the next chart, Avadis. I'll share a few statistics so you get a sense of where, where we're operating. And these are from 2020. And um, for the last 20 years, RAP has had high single digit growth year over year. Due to the pandemic in 2020, we took a, a small step backwards, um, but we've already come out in the first quarter uh, making up for that lost ground. And in addition, we used that reset during the pandemic where we couldn't do as many on site visits as we would normally do to update and refresh our documentation and to improve, for example, our website and other outreach tools. But here's our footprint. China is number one, uh, as it is uh, the leading supplier still for apparel uh, in, in the North American market, followed by Vietnam, Bangladesh, and India. We've seen an increase in, in, in registration activity for RAP in Pakistan, as well as an increase in apparel exports um, from Pakistan. Cambodia and Indonesia have been you know, flat the last couple of years for us in terms of certification activity along with Sri Lanka. But we're also tracking a, uh, a pickup in uh, Northern Africa and the Middle East for production, including uh, countries like Egypt and Jordan. And in addition, we see it as our number 10 uh, for registrations, Mexico uh, picking up activity under the US uh, MCA. And we'll go to the next chart, Avadis. So this chart, I'll just take a few minutes and tell you how you get RAP certified, what it costs, and, and why you ought to consider RAP over other programs. So if you're a new facility, it's pretty easy. You just go to the RAP website, and you can download the pre-audit self-assessment tool. It provides instructions and guidance to help the facility prepare for the RAP audit, and to lay in the policies and procedures that will be necessary to show that you're meeting the 12 principles of the RAP program. Typically, it's going to suggest that you assign a manager or a team to lead that process. And for RAP, it's not a one and done. It is a recurring cycle. And so you don't want to do this just for one visit. It is changes to your processes and policies on a going forward basis. Uh, when, when you're ready, after you've gone through that pre-audit assessment, you go ahead to the website and you fill out an application, you get a RAP ID. And when you're ready to put the money down, you pay RAP all of $11.95 US dollars. Uh, that fee hasn't gone up in five years. That's, that's where RAP pays for its overhead and its office and its staffing. And uh, once you pay that fee, you open a six month window uh, to complete your audit and get your certification. When you're ready to commence the audit, you go to the website and RAP will have identified accredited, RAP trained, auditors for the region where you're located. Uh, the facility will make that selection and that opens a 30-day window unannounced for the audit team to visit. When the team comes on site, they do the usual things you would expect from a facility audit. They take a tour, they meet with uh, employees, 
they'll interview management, and they'll take a deep dive on documentation, particularly around you know, uh, record keeping, production records, and payment and benefit records. And then um, the audit report, uh, the audit concludes, there's an audit report, and uh, if there is a non-compliance, uh, a cap will be open, a corrective action plan. And if it's something that can be done quickly, it's minor, that can be cleaned up within 10 days before the audit report is submitted to wrap and close, or the report will be submitted and there'll be a cap attached to it and that cap will later be cleared before the certification decision is made. Uh, that report goes to an independent review board that RAP uh, established. They make a recommendation and the RAP compliance team finalizes that recommendation. A certification is issued, a literal certificate is forwarded to the facility. Typically, it's a gold certification valid for 12 months. About 90 days before the expiration of that certification, you begin the process again. That's why you maintain the organization and the policies and the approach to work through the audit uh, at the 12 month mark. So why, why RAP? What, what is the value proposition for RAP versus other approaches? First of all, one approach is, can you do it yourself? Should you do it yourself? And in the early days, this was a typical solution, particularly when Avidi showed the factories that you were sourcing from were your own. It made a lot of sense to use your own people. You did an audit. Um, but now that the supply chain is much more complex, uh, that model is uh, not a good one. It uh, is expensive. And importantly, RAP is a third party independent certification model. When you use your own auditors against your own code of conduct, you're grading your own exam. Uh, the credibility isn't as high, nor are you improving and updating your documentation year over year and maintaining your program expertise. Uh, this is clearly an area where outsourcing makes sense. The only question is who do you wanna outsource your certification process to? For RAP, we feel the fee is modest. It's paid by the factory. The factory receives the certification. It can show the certification to other buyers and reduce the audit fatigue that often is in place in our industry. If you have a problem with that factory, and I know this from experience, um, Avadis will step forward or some other spokesperson from RAP will literally meet the press and explain the process and the steps that were taken and that these were uh, you know, effective due diligence steps Occasionally things happen, but we will step forward and, and, and communicate the value of the program and what you did to make sure you were being responsible. RAP has staff on the ground. Uh, they're experts and they will troubleshoot the problems. Um, we have a well-run uh, and well-running compliance engine based in, in, in the Washington, D.C. area. But in terms of value, you know, you might say, well, some programs cost half as much, um, leaving a, a, aside the cost for the auditors. Um, but with RAP, not only do you get a high value program and social compliance verification, you are also achieving in a single audit the CTPAT PIP uh, verification that you need to be able to demonstrate due diligence in your supply chain. So we feel you're getting excellent value for your RAP investment. Our footprint matches your footprint in almost all cases. We have trained monitors in each of those locations. So we like the idea of one audit for social compliance, one audit for supply chain security and RAP's reliability and, and, and demonstrated record over 21 years. So that's my value proposition. That's our value proposition. At this time, what I would like to do is to turn it over to Georgetta Navadarsky, Vice President of Supply Chain for StormTech, and let her tell you uh, her experience with RAP and whether she feels as positive as I do. Thank you very much. Georgetta? Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I am delighted to be part of this exciting discussion on social compliance, and thank you for attending this webinar. I'll start with briefly introducing StormTech, after which I'll provide an overview of our approach to social compliance, and I'll share our experience working with RAP. Founded in 1977 in Vancouver as a small specialty sporting goods supplier, now StoneTech is one of the largest promotional apparel suppliers in Canada. 
Blake Amable is the founder and the company is privately family owned. With offices in Vancouver, Toronto and London, England, StoneTech sells its products through worldwide distribution channel servicing over 10,000 distributors in over 50 countries. For over 40 years, StoneTech has been designing and supplying highly technical outdoor apparel, bags and accessories for the promotional products and retail markets. Today, StoneTech is a global leader in premium outdoor apparel and offers over 600 styles of outerwear, bags and accessories for the B2B and B2C markets. Since the start of current pandemic last March, we provided full support for fabric mills and factories within our supply chain. We took full responsibility of the raw materials and trims related to all our orders and had zero orders canceled, which we are proud of. Keeping our inventory at the safe levels was one of the biggest advantage we had during this uncertain time. Our short-term first initiative during pandemic was to support the local health authorities with sourcing millions of PPE products in record time. After that, our long-term strategic initiative was on designing few highly technical performance, reusable face masks that would comply with all the regulation and standard testing requirements. Overall, last year was one of StoneTech's most successful year, despite all the hardship we encountered. I read this next slide, please. Now I'll share with you what is our approach to social compliance. Today, supply chains require greater transparency and traceability than ever before, as supply chains are becoming more complex due to greater distances and multiple geographies. The increasing importance of trust means that we, as buyers, need to know our supply chains inside out and ensure the appropriate controls are in place to manage compliance, social and ethical risk. StoneTech is firmly committed to selling products that are manufactured under legal, safe and fair working condition in factories where employees are treated fairly. Our ethical sourcing policy is created to ensure that our global supply chain operates in compliance to all applicable laws governing issues such as child labor, forced labor, wages, benefits, working hours, harassment, health and safety, factory security, and environmental safety. We developed a supplier workplace code of conduct that is a mandatory agreement for all suppliers and a fundamental part of our terms and conditions for import purchasing. This code of conduct is updated on a regular basis is translated in several languages to ensure clear communication on standards, and it is enforced through our social compliance process. Most of our suppliers' facilities are being audited by third-party monitoring organizations mandated by RAP. We monitor each supplier for social compliance status on a periodic basis at the required frequency and based on the risk assessment and prior audit findings. When onboarding a new supplier, we have a very comprehensive sourcing practice that require various pre-qualifying audits of new factories before final approval and commencing to any first trial order. Over the years, StoneTech has developed a very strong global sourcing network that is based on long-term partnership and business relationships. Our supply chain contains nominated tier two with textile meals and tier one with garment, bags, accessory suppliers that can manufacture about any product. Compliance assessment for both tiers of suppliers are executed on a regular basis, and that includes factory assessment on social compliance, fire and electrical safety, structural building safety and security. For more information on StoneTech Corporate Social Responsibility Program or to view our complete workplace code of conduct, please visit our website 
and I'm very excited to share with you all that our new corporate social responsibility platform will be live by end of June when we will publish Stone Tech Road to Sustainability. So stay tuned. Have this next slide, please. During the last 15 years, I've been attending most of major compliance seminars provided by the CAF, AAFA, TexWorld, PPAI, or Sourcing at MAGIC. That is how I first met Avedis. Rob was literally everywhere we attended compliance seminars or workshops. We even met at the Source Africa a few years ago. From the very beginning, when we started onboarding our factories for RAP compliance, we benefited from many learning and training opportunities. We developed our workplace code of conduct policies based on the RAP 12 principles. The best learning experience on compliance we had that are worth sharing is the RAP General Awareness Training Seminar. This seminar were very well received by our executives, management, and all the CSR stakeholders involved as it provides great education on compliance. RAP facilitated training courses for our Bangladesh offices auditors. With their five-day lead auditor training and the two-day internal auditor training. Based on this, we are able to educate and certify our own staff that help us tremendously to run our own auditing at the factories. The RAP Wire Safety Awareness course and CityPAD was also taken by most of our factories and heard only great reviews. Today, majority of the manufacturing partners in our supply chain are RAP certified and few other factories are certified by additional BSCI, ISO, et cetera. Our suppliers are saying that adopting RAP system resulted in more reliable social compliance factories and that RAP has contributed to greater productivity, lower turnover, improved communication between management and employees, safe, safer working condition, and improved morale. Today, our factories recognize RAP as the most prestigious, reliable, and efficient factory compliance system to assure lawful, ethical, and humane manufacturing. Finally, and based on my experience from 15 years at Ash City and five years in StormTech, working with different auditing companies, RAP was the best company to work with. Very approachable, flexible, with endless educational materials, that supported us to set up our compliance platform. Therefore, RAP is highly recommended as it is peace of mind when it comes to compliance assurance of our supply chain. Thank you all for listening and please feel free to reach out to me. I would be more than happy to answer your questions. Now I will turn over to Mr. Avery Severian for the final few slides and before we open the Q&A. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Georgetta. That was uh, incredibly kind of you. And, and uh, just so everybody knows, I had no idea she was going to say all those things. Uh, I feel we should stop the webinar right here. It can't get any better than that. Uh, but uh, I did promise that we will talk a little bit about what some hot topics are that uh, we're keeping a close eye on at RAP and folks who are practitioners in our space uh, are, are paying attention to. So let's do that. And uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, present the general overview of them and we can dive deeper into any one of these or more that might interest you uh, in particular. By far the biggest single issue right now that keeps uh, social compliance folks awake at night is that of, of modern slavery, human trafficking and forced labor. Uh, we're seeing this in several manifestations, sadly, uh, throughout the world right now, whether it's specific instances that are tied to particular geographies or whether it is the more broader uh, concern with regards to increased attention, especially when it comes to migrant labor issues. Um, those of you who are sourcing from countries that have migrant workers in the workforce uh, are going to want to be particularly careful because increased attention is being paid to the methods by which such workers are being procured and what measures are in place to ensure that they don't end up becoming bonded servants in a way because they've had to take out major loans in order to get the job in the first place and cannot effectively leave and go back to their homes because they owe money to usurious lenders uh, that are basically 
uh, keeping them in bondage. So uh, these are the single biggest sort of group of issues. And it is particularly important to note that this is the general topic that the socially responsible investment community, the SRI community, has really taken uh, uh, ownership over. So it's not simply a matter of activist NGOs uh, and organizations uh, seeking to uh, challenge industry. It is also investment bodies, you know, whether it's a Norwegian sovereign fund, whether it's ICCR, whether it's even a more traditional organization like BlackRock increasingly saying, what are you doing to ensure uh, freedom from forced labor in your supply chain? This is the single biggest hot topic in the social compliance arena at the moment. Another set of topics that have been around forever, but continue to emerge in various forms and become uh, uh, more important these days is the whole question of wages and hours. Interlinked, obviously, uh, as you can imagine, um, as conversations uh, abound on fairness of wages and a topic that has come back into prominence, especially because of the pandemic and some challenges certain supply chains experienced with regards to cancellation of orders and non-payment of uh, goods that had already been shipped or finished in factories. It is particularly uh, commendable that StormTech was able to avoid these challenges, for example, uh, where, where other much bigger players really continue to suffer as a result of them. The context in which these conversations are happening is something else that uh, Georgetta referenced, the issue of transparency, greater supply chain transparency, greater visibility into the agreements between buyers and manufacturers, uh, and trying to make that more of a two-way conversation rather than a simple one-way dictation of terms. Another set of issues that are becoming increasingly talked about, uh, and once again, uh, while they began, these conversations began prior to the pandemic, the pandemic has certainly accelerated the discussions uh, on technology-based solutions to supply chain due diligence. These cover a series of topics, including things like remote audits, uh, which is one of the main ones that the pandemic accelerated, obviously, because for a big chunk, starting around this time last year, it was not physically possible to visit factories, and yet due diligence needed to be done. So how could we get that sense of assurance that factories continue to be operating safely, humanely, and ethically? Well, can we get some kind of a video uh, uh, feed? Can we get some sort of Zoom-based conversations with workers and factory managers? That kind of remote audit discussion continues. And there's a lot of uh, uh, good progress made in this regard, although we continue to believe that uh, while they will become important tools in the overall arsenal, it's going to still be important to have that on the ground physical visit, especially for first time factories that you're engaging with, because you're never going to be able to substitute for that eyes on the ground uh, during that initial assessment. Other technology based things that are being looked at quite deeply are what technology enabled ways can we enhance workers voice when it comes to these social audits. Um, you've heard from Mark that they are a core part of the factory visit. Any credible program will have worker interviews at the very center of the process. But by definition, these are sampling exercises. So you, you can't speak to all the workers. Is there a way through technology, through some kind of web-based or app-based survey tool that we can hear from more workers or hear more from the workers that we're talking to? Those are the kinds of things that are being explored. And then finally, with regards to the whole transparency issue, the whole topic of blockchain keeps coming up um, and, and refinements are being made on this distributed ledger method of ensuring information is kept untampered. Um, and that's one point I will make with regards to blockchain. Uh, it is important to understand that it is effectively a safe. Once you put information in there, you're going to be assured that that information remains untainted. But it doesn't by itself address the veracity of the information when it comes to that original placement of it in the safe. If you put garbage in, you're going to get garbage out. You're just going to be sure it's the same garbage. So be careful about over-reliance on blockchain, but it does have great value and the great potential to, uh, to speak to the credibility of the chain of custody of information when it comes to communicating with your consumers. Finally, a topic that is increasingly getting attention uh, and was touched upon in a couple of contexts already is the whole issue of harmonization and, and standardization. Uh, we have now realized the challenges of brands 
being the fox guarding the hen house when it comes to reviewing their own supply chains and the audit fatigue that that creates. And so in order to reduce that, brands are looking for partners, looking at RAP, uh, looking to have less reliance on their own programs and greater cred credibility through use of independent, independent programs. But there is still a change in mindset that needs to happen. And in this regard, RAP issued a white paper last summer that talked about the new paradigm that relies on independent third-party programs that provide a menu of options for solutions to, for supply chain due diligence instead of using proprietary internal programs. And we, we titled that approach symphonization. It's a term I know Bob's not too fond of, but uh, I will mention that there is a paper out there on it and you can click here uh, when you receive the PDF of this to read it uh, in detail should you be uh, so interested. All right, let me uh, bring this to a close and, and talk a little bit about some best practices you really need to be considering if you don't already have in place when it comes to your supply chain due diligence uh, programs. It boils down to making sure that you're doing this in a systemic fashion. You must integrate social compliance objectives with general management systems and no longer treat it like it used to be a decade, couple of decades ago as a side gig or as an afterthought. It is no longer possible for your sourcing folks to go out there, find a factory, determine that they like the quality, they like the price, and they can agree on a good delivery, and then place an order, and only then send your supply chain in, uh, supply chain social compliance people in to check that the factory is, is kosher to do business with. No, now that compliance piece has to be that initial threshold requirement that determines whether or not a factory can be engaged with to begin with. Uh, and it's not just the factory that you have to engage with. This is the other key thing that has changed. It's simply no longer an exercise between the buyer and the manufacturer. This is happening in a broader society with a whole set of stakeholders, including civil society, including social responsible investors, including governments that you must engage with to build relationships and get conversations going, which are ultimately gonna be about fostering trust in the supply chain as a whole through and to greater transparency uh, for, this, for these conversations to be able to happen effectively. But to start it all off, to build that foundation on which all of this can happen, you must have good audits as the base of the process. And keep in mind that you should not see audits as an end in and of themselves. There is no destination that you can get to and say, I'm done, I'm socially responsible. It is a journey. It is something that has to be engaged with regularly and ultimately is about continuous improvement. At the heart of it all is the kind of stuff we're doing right here. Engagement through resources like the CAF, like RAP, so that you have continuous education of yourself, your managers, your suppliers, and the folks in those factories. That is ultimately uh, the sine qua non for modern supply chain due diligence. And that's where I will end things, uh, by going back to the point I was making about that brave new world in which we now operate. We are in a, an era where branding is about engagement, engagement with the consumer, because that's the way to their heart and ultimately through to their wallet, which is what you're duty bound as a corporation seeking to maximize your impact uh, to, to seek out. And that modern consumer, uh, and as discussed, the modern corporation, the philosophical essence of what it is, why it is, is demanding greater transparency and is insisting on responsible sourcing as a foundation for doing business. These are now factors that are core to your brand reputation, core to your ability to do business to begin with. And as uh, Georgetta alluded to, these expectations are no longer limited to just your first tier, the cut and sews, but are now going further up stream and into your uh, second tier and beyond as expectations go deeper into the supply chain. Bottom line, responsible sourcing, that supply chain social compliance due diligence is now a critical part of the competition matrix of the whole sourcing process. It has to be centrally and effectively and systemically managed and done so independently and credibly, which is where I will wrap things up, no pun intended, a properly implemented and credibly certified, in other words, a RAP certified compliance system is necessary to protect your brand, to succeed in business, and to be able to source effectively in this brave new world. Thank you for your attention. Um, I look forward to some questions in the 10 minutes we have remaining. I'll leave this information up there. 
uh, should you wish to contact us after the fact. But um, I invite Bob to uh, lead the discussion for the remainder of this webinar. So, uh, sir, uh, I want to thank Abidus for that uh, presentation, Mark and Jordan as well. Uh, and I have a, a couple of questions, uh, and I'll, I'll put two or three different ones together, uh, and then we'll see how we can make the best use. We have about five more minutes, and we want to end pretty much right on the spot at three o'clock Eastern. So, uh, once again, anyone that wishes to ask a question, ask it. There's a question icon in the control panel. Any question we don't get to, we'll refer that to the uh, speakers. So, uh, so first of all, thank you both, uh, as well as Georgetta for the, the presentation. Uh, and uh, I'll come at the end, just talk about the responsive business conduct policy of the Canadian government, which I think really just reinforces what you said. Uh, through the different things that were said, uh, a couple things came up. Uh, and I wanted to speak to two things that were very prominent in Bangladesh. And uh, Avidus was involved with the uh, uh, with the Alliance on Bangladesh Worker Safety, we were a little bit as well. Uh, factory safety. So traditionally, RAP has been about social, about labor standards and things like that. And I just want to understand how much you can do on, on factory safety. Is it something that you look at? Is it something you refer to others? Uh, so that was one thing. And another thing in the Bangladesh context, the whole issue of um, unauthorized subcontracting. So uh, we had a question about, you know, what do you do about that? Uh, uh, do you kick people out? Is there no tolerance of that? So maybe you could speak to that, to either Mark or Avidus. Yeah, those are uh, two great questions, Bob, and I'll start. And Mark, if you have anything to add, uh, please uh, feel free to jump in. Um, with regards to factory safety, uh, that's core to RAPS requirements. Principle eight is health and safety um, and is the single most intense principle in terms of the number of questions and the number of things that are looked at. Uh, and obviously uh, our experience uh, in, in Bangladesh uh, uh, makes us particularly knowledgeable of some of the, um, shall we say, penumbral issues there, right? It's not simply a matter of policies and procedures, but of physical structural safety. And how does one uh, assure that uh, when most social auditors are really not structural engineers. We have processes in place to require, for example, in high-risk countries like Bangladesh, the uh, provision of a DEA, Detailed Engineering Assessment, uh, done by an independent engineering firm as part of the social audit, because you can be as kind a manufacturer and have as good a set of policies with regards to your workers as possible, but if that roof's gonna fall on their heads, it doesn't matter. So we have all that in place. We also recognize, in addition to a very solid audit protocol to check for problems that you really want to be part of the solution. We want to be able to educate these factories as to how to make themselves safer. And so while we do not engage in consulting, as you can imagine, that will be a conflict of interest since we're going to be the ones certifying that the factories are indeed meeting our requirements. We do have general training programs that focus and teach them things like proper risk assessment methodologies, how to go about checking for yourself, where are the physical dangers that pr propose health and safety concerns for your workers and how can you make sure that they're addressed. We have material on that on our website. Uh, we run live courses on that. Uh, we run live courses on things like fire safety. Uh, and in addition to all of this, because of the pandemic last year, we've taken much of these materials and created digital versions of them. So we'll be providing modular online training aimed at factory managers for things like effective risk assessment uh, through partnerships with uh, online training programs that uh, make this widely and easily available to players all over the supply chain. So um, I'll stop there for the first question. I don't know, Mark, if you want to add anything, and then I'll address the issue of subcontracting. Why don't you hit, why don't you hit subcontracting as well, Avadis? All right. So, uh, you know, Bob, that, as you know, is an extremely difficult challenge um, and really one that, that highlights the, the, the uh, problem of lack of visibility in supply chains. I think most brands and retailers ought to be extremely careful uh, and not fool themselves into thinking that this is not something that, that's going to be a problem for them. Because you might well do enough due diligence to say, okay, I'm placing a, you know, name a number, 20,000 units order in a factory that's got 50,000 units capacity. So I'm well within their capacity. They'll make it all on that site. But you don't know who else they've said yes to. They've said yes to three other 20,000 unit orders. Mm -hmm. So where are they gonna make that? Uh, you run a real risk. So the advice we give 
is really quite simple. Look for transparency and say to them, you know, if you're not going to make the stuff in this factory, that's not necessarily a problem. Just tell us where you're going to make it so we can make sure that we check that unit out and make sure that that's okay. Uh, right. And so the proper stick and carrot there, you know, don't simply say you can't do it and, and, and make yourself uh, run the risk of not being able to validate. Say, if you're going to, you got to let us know and we got to make sure we see that and be open about it because that's the only way to, to protect yourself. This is rampant in you know, places like Bangladesh, even in China, and you're gonna be very hard pressed unless you're gonna be able to have a QA person there all the time just to be sure that the product is, is be, being made there. The final thing I will say, you cannot really rely on social audits as the only way to solve this. Because again, we're there more frequently perhaps than you could be, but even we're not there all the time. So it, it, it really is a larger conversation about transparency and that combination of you know, stick and carrot to make sure that you're protecting your supply chain. Uh, Georgetta, we just have a minute to go. I mean, uh, presumably you've dealt with issues about subcontracting and things like this, and and RAP has maybe helped you resolve those things. Maybe, can you just say how you've been dealing with it? Because it's obviously a complex issue. Almost every question we've got is more or less about caching factories, illegal subcontracting, all these kinds of things. How do you deal with it? Yeah. So um, from our side, it's not uh, for us to be certain that our orders are executed in the factories which are approved based on the compliance and everything we monitor. We actually were uh, having um, third party assign agreements to companies which are doing our QC. So we can say we have our boots on the ground and which means that our products will not be inspected only when it's finished because we know that products can be transferred from a factory to another factory. If people want to do, uh, if, if factories wants to do um, any uh, goods in a factory which is not approved by us, where we won't have visibility, but that's impossible to happen because our QC program and inspection are required to be done at the cutting stage, at the inline stage, and at the final stage. So we receive reports on a weekly basis about where our products are. We have zero tolerance for subcon or any other uh, goods manufactured in uh, uh, facilities which are not approved by Stormtech. And uh, so that that is part of our policy. So we have a great control on from this perspective, I think. Okay. So you use RAP, but you you take other measures to make sure things because get done that's properly. part of the our uh, quality assurance program, and and quality assurance and quality control works uh, very well on uh, making sure that we, the all our inspectors are aware that okay this factor is compliant we monitor on on very regular bas basis like i explained and uh, they won't be able to go in a factory which we never give a green line that factory can produce the orders perfect okay now we are actually a few minutes over i could ask a bunch more questions so uh but i'm gonna hold back i just want to First of all, thank Avidis. Uh, I'm sorry I dislike the term symphonization, but I think uh, I have some other people that find it a troubling word. Um, uh, but other than that, uh, I think RAP is a very good solution. I want to thank you guys for helping to explain it. Uh, at the end of this session today, uh, any questions that's been asked and we haven't quite answered it, it'll go to, to Mark and Avidis uh, and it'll be uh, available for them to respond to. I think they're pretty straightforward things. I, I don't think they're overarching questions that everyone needs to hear. Um, uh, but if there are some things that come in as questions of this that you'd like to, to be distributed, we'll do that. Uh, as soon as you click off today, there'll be a quick survey. A answer the survey. If you want someone from RAP to contact you, they will. If you want someone from the Canadian Apparel Federation to contact you, we will. And I do just want to say one thing, and I want to, first of all, also thank Georgetta, because I think it's nice to have real people no disrespect to myself, Avidis, and Mark, but you, you know, you have a direct contact with those factories, and you have a 
some credibility. Uh, uh, we're in the government relations business in many respects, and I do want to say that there really has never been a time, except for maybe the 1990s, when corporate social responsibility is so crazy. Uh, we have issues around sanctions on China, around Xinjiang and the cotton produced there. Uh, we have a modern slavery legislation in the Canadian Parliament. We have new uh, prohibitions against importing goods made with forced labor as of July 1st of last year. So it's all of a sudden illegal to import any goods made uh, in whole or in part with forced labor, which was not the case until last July. So there's really quite a few things. Uh, and so I do want to stress that you'll see a lot more things. I think it's more important than ever to find solutions, whether it's RAP or something else. Uh, but today it's RAP, so hell, use use RAP. Uh, so once again, uh, the survey will come to everyone. Answer those questions. If you have some follow-up that you need, you'll have options to uh, uh, ask for it. We'll have another session with RAP later in the year. And so maybe if you say we need to find out this, maybe we'll incorporate it into the next one. Uh, and again, so uh, I think it's part of a discussion. It's not just one day that we'll deal with this. Uh, and uh, so again, thank you all speakers. Thank you to all the people that attended. And with that, I think we need to wrap it up because we're six minutes over. So once again, thank you all. Thank you, thank Georgia you. in particular. And uh, at this point, I'll wrap things up, open intended, and uh, uh, make sure that, to answer the survey that's uh, presented to you. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Bob. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.